This conference will now be recorded. Thank you. We are ready to start. I am extremely sorry for the issues. We had some internet upgrade issues that caused us to have to reboot and we are not live streaming tonight unfortunately or we we are not live streaming tonight unfortunately that was um, we are unable to get that going but the session will be recorded and broadcast um, and we'll um, start this evening so and we have them mute. you. Welcome. I will call to order the Tuesday, August 4th meeting of the Monmouth City Council and ask for the roll call, please, Phyllis Bullman. Councillor Belts. Here. Councillor Carey. Here. Councillor Lopez. Here. Councillor Sharmer. Here. Councillor Schinkel is excused. Councillor Silbernagel. Here. Mayor Kuntz. Here. And um, if all will mute, we will do the flag salute. Um, Councillor Belts, can I ask you to lead that and have everyone else mute yourselves? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. Thank you very much. And this evening, um, I will read our public comment script. We have a variety of types of comments this evening. I've got some folks in the room. We have one comment that was sent in advance to the uh, city recorder, and we may have some folks online. So um, <clears throat> I would like to welcome everyone to the Monmouth City Council meeting. Comments from the community are entertained during the time designated under citizens' comments. Um, if you wish to speak, please fill out the comment card. We have that. If you are online, please open the chat bubble in the upper right and type to Phyllis Bowman only your name and the topic on which you would like to speak. Speakers' comments in this forum are limited to three minutes. Tonight, um, if we have many speakers, I, I will potentially limit those to two. Um, I'm not sure how many folks are calling in to speak. So we'll take a look at that. Typically a speaker's comment is taken under advisement to allow time for the council to review an issue. However, the mayor or councilors may ask a speaker for additional information or may convey some information that addresses their comment. Please note um, if you would like to receive follow-up communication. And I'd like to thank everyone for their attendance at this evening's meeting of the Monmouth City Council. Tonight, we start off as we do with the consent calendar, and um, this week that consists of our minutes of July 21st. We held both a regular session and a work session of July 21st, and I will ask uh, for any corrections or additions to the minutes or a motion to approve them as presented. Move to approve the consent calendar. Thank you, Councillor Belts. A second? Second. All right. Thank you, Councillor Silbernagel. And all in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Okay. Thank you. Seeing none, uh, we will start off with our reports this evening. 
And the report I would like to make um, regards our um, Economic Development Commission and we or advisory group at this point. We had discussed at our January retreat, seemingly forever ago, uh, really learned about some potential economic development strategies, got some great information from presenters, and spent some time really thinking through um, sort of the framework for an economic development plan. Um, that plan has been worked on by our interim city manager, Chad Olson, with our community development director, Sam Duffner, and other staff. And we would like to convene a group to really go through that plan, um, to sort of vet some of the thinking, early thinking that we have, to give continual advice to us and be able to come back and really adopt a plan. Um, this is not a formal border commission at this point. It is It is an ad hoc advisory committee, really advising our staff on that thinking. And so what I would like to do tonight, um, in your packet, there was a report from Chad Olson and Suzanne about um, the appointments that they have considered. And I really want to thank John Kerry, who worked on this as well, um, developed some of these sort of ideas about how to proceed with this and contacted many of these folks to determine their interest and availability for sort of a short-term um, stint on this advisory committee. Um, Chad, did you have anything to add to this? Uh, no, thank you, Madam Mayor. No, nothing to add to it. I appreciate the work that um, the mayor and the two council members, uh, uh, Carrie and Peltz, has done putting the list together. And uh, Suzanne Duffner, the community development director, and I are looking forward to uh, beginning it. And as I will remind everybody, this is an ad hoc committee. So the intention is to just have uh, a limited number of meetings and then uh, submit the report from the uh, committee to the city council for its review, consideration, and ultimately adopt adoption. Great, thanks. And Councillor Kerry um, or Councillor Belts, do you have anything to add to that? Uh, uh, Madam Mayor, I would only add that, that it's a uh, what, I, what we believe to be a diverse group, a variety of different interests and, and abilities and experiences. Uh, sort of cuts across a lot of a lot of our uh, sectors. So um, we feel like it'll be a good sounding board and one that will be able to enhance um, some of the things that we that we've talked about. And that's one of the things that I'm sure they'll be anxious to do is to how, how they can enhance and make suggestions, um, not only re with respect to um, sort of the, the draft plan that's out there, but uh, they'll be able to make it better with their own ideas. Thank you so much. So what uh, piece of business I have tonight, um, as usual, when I invite uh, you to approve a list of folks to support us as volunteers in our work um, in your packet this evening was actually a really amazing list of people who are interested and willing to help us on this venture and I am going to ask for your um, motion to approve and the appointment of these folks to this ad hoc advisory committee. I'll move to approve uh, this list of um, uh, individuals as appointments to the Monmouth Economic Development Strategic Planning Committee. Thank you, Councillor Lopez, and a second. I'll second. Kidar and Silbernagel. All in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 You have any opposed? That we will um, get them started on that work, and I really appreciate your generous 
use of um, information of their time to this effort so we can kind of get this moving. Um, that's all I have. I'm going to leave time for citizen comments, but if there are any other reports for boards and commissions at this time, we would entertain those. And Councillor Sharmer, your microphone is on. Did you do you have a report for us? Your group hasn't been meeting at all, I don't think. So thanks. Any Councillor Belts? Yes, I just wanted to report briefly. Um I'm the um council representative on the Mid Willamette Valley Council of Governments board, and we have had a subcommittee meeting the um, executive director search subcommittee. We did meet virtually um, and we helped design a recruitment brochure very similar to what we designed for our own uh, uh, city manager search brochure. Um, we designed it, made sure it had lots of um, photos of the entire region, not just Salem. Salem. And there's a beautiful, uh, oops, I'm getting some feedback. Okay, there's a there's a lovely photo from Western Oregon University in that brochure. Um, and so the search firm, we all approved it, and um, that should be uh, that should be hitting the street in pretty short order. So if you know of anybody that might be an excellent executive director for the Middle Limit Valley Council of Governments, please contact me, let me know, and I will forward that name on to the search firm. Thank you. That's great. Thank you very much. Any other reports? Councillor Lopez. Has yes, Councillor Lopez. Hello, thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, I do have a Minet report. Um, we met, uh, we met, and as part of our um, July meeting each year, we or every two years, we do appoint um, new uh, new officers of the board of the of directors, and those new officers are um, David Ritchie, acting as president, who is a uh, Monmouth resident. Um, the vice president is Tom Pessemeyer, who is the um, city manager of the City of Independence, and uh, myself as the secretary of the board. And um, in addition to uh, in addition to these board appointments of uh, of officers, um, I'm happy to report that uh, Willamette Valley Fiber installations and the expansion out into Dallas is back on track. Um, the Monmouth and Independence, the original operation um, uh, geographic area, has seen uh, has seen some growth as well. Not the physical area, rather, but um, but new uh, new service signups. Uh, this is the first July in the past couple of years that we've actually seen an increase in the service signups, um, and that's an increase across all the services we offer. And uh, I'm really excited to see that uh, that people are taking advantage of this uh, local asset that we have. That's Minet. Um, all of this uh, good news, I think, is reflected. And forgive me, Janet, for jumping ahead a little bit, but Minet is, you'll notice, mentioned uh, positively in the, uh, the the financial update as well. So um, all things are going uh, going fairly well there. Um, finances aside, I know that we did have some previous uh, previous outages um, last year, and we've completed a little while ago. We've completed the um, oh gosh, was it two years ago actually that we had the outages? Anyway, um, we we completed the uh, GPON upgrade project some time ago. Um, we've also been doing an uh, quite a bit of work upgrading our internal redundancies, and so this is uh, this is how MyNet and MyNet customers actually get out and speak to the rest of the greater internet. And that full system has um, new and upgraded redundancies as well, and uh, should be very stable for the future. Great. Okay. Don't see any other board and commission reports at this point. Uh, so we will move to Chad Olson for our interim city manager report. Thank you, Madam Mayor, members of the city council. So in the interest of time and uh, not to break any hearts, I'll go ahead and just um, mention a couple things that are in the report 
Uh, one, a reminder that Thursday, uh, the council has a special meeting with Steve Worthington from Prothman at 5.30 to uh, redo, re review uh, finalists for possibly a um, uh, in-town interviews uh, sometime towards the end of this month. So we're all excited about that. Um, the uh, finance director and I and Suzanne have been talking with uh, Piper Sandler and company. They're a, a financing company that we all have experience with over time of uh, working towards a some type of loan or debt issuance for the urban renewal agency um, for the uh, first couple years of uh, projects that we have scheduled to perform. And uh, I probably will ask the mayor to have a urban renewal meeting on the 18th. So kind of anticipate a half hour meeting or so to brief the council on those things. And a reminder that your uh, LOC priority, legislative priority worksheet is due by Friday. Um, the LOC is having a, a meeting next week and they do want to see all the cities uh, respond to that. So if you can get those to uh, the city recorder and we'll uh, compile a composite and send those on to the League of Oregon Cities. And with that, I will just um, open for questions. Otherwise, I'm, I'm finished. Uh, I'll just jump in. Um, Chad, I just want to confirm that Thursday meeting time. I had it at 6 o'clock. Is it 5.30? Are we confirmed at 5.30? Uh, yes, and I'm sorry, maybe we didn't get that update. We hope to be able to start at 5.30 if that works for folks. So we had um, some folks who had to leave at 7 and we wanted to try and start a little earlier, Is that if that works. Yes, so hopefully that works with the um, with the council for an early start at 5.30. I try to finish by 6 30 to uh, 6 45 um there's uh, some conflict meetings that evening so we were looking for an early start but that's not a requirement if there's other conflicts thank you thanks for the question <clears throat> um so Moving on to Janet Chenard, our Director of Finance for our fourth quarter, which is the fourth quarter of the fiscal year, so the one that ended June 30th. Janet. Thank you, Madam Mayor and Honorable Council Members. And I too will try and keep it short, although I do like to wax on at year end because there's been a lot of activity, obviously, for 12 months. Um, in short, hopefully had a chance to look at the packet, but uh, the news is pretty good. Uh, considering the times. we The things that are not as good were expected, and that is the that the street fund, um, of course, did come in. The gas taxes came in lower because fewer people are traveling and buying gas. And tourism fund, um, the last quarter, our, our local hoteliers and, uh, and uh, lodgings um, were hard hit, as we expected. So, uh, but nevertheless, we still ended up even, you know, at about three quarters of what we expected in revenues in both of those funds and higher, in fact, in the street funds, so uh, than three quarters. So, so that was not bad. Um, and overall, the property tax revenues and um, state shared revenues, which are the big ticket revenues in the general fund, along with an influx, as I mentioned at a previous meeting of a of coronavirus coronavirus relief fund grant money um, served to help us end the the year about $140,000 higher in the general fund than we anticipated when we put the 19-2021 uh, budget together. So, um, you know, otherwise, that's all I have to say on, on how the funds are doing, uh, generally very upbeat. I did want to draw your attention to page 33 where I, I did... Uh, give a bit of an update on where we are with the PERS economic incentive funds because of course with all of the volatility that we've seen in the stock market through the last several months, um, the, it was the earnings were very hard hit in um, the March and April period but have bounced back um, almost 
uh, as much as they lost again. And so it's hard to know where we'll end the calendar year uh, for earnings, which is part of what helps determine the rates. But we will know more um, in October from the actuaries as to what our employer rates are going to look like for the next biennium. And right now, um, it's it's really hard to tell, but it's still looking positive because of a number of the initiatives that came through in Senate Bill 1049, as well as the fact that uh, Council approved uh, setting aside some um, reserve funds from last year into a separate side account. That should also help our uh, our bottom line. So. Overall, um, we were seeing that rates may actually only go up about 0.6% based on the actuarial um, estimates most recently given. So that's good news. And with that, I think I would uh, take any questions you have. Yes, Councillor Kerry. Uh, just very quickly, uh, Janet, I, uh, I, I noted in, in on your, you know, green and yellow uh, chart, the uh, sewer and water um, were under budget, and then the, uh, and then right below that SBC, uh, while revenues were down, we were still, uh, our reserves were higher. Um, <clears throat> good news, bottom line. Uh, I guess I'm, I'm a little curious as to, you know, why? Did we just stop spending money because we were concerned with revenues or did we over budget and, uh, um, you know, and not, not really have the project or bandwidth to be able to spend the dollars? I, it's not a criticism yeah, I, on either. And I'm just curious as to, you know, I, I coming out of the budgeting process and meeting these fund balances, we need to be cautious and, terms of how we're allocating spending. Right. So with the water fund, it is still bolstered somewhat by the loan from the sewer fund, and that's helping the fund balance there. As as always, we don't get capital projects completed um, as timely as we'd like because we do try to put a lot on our program plate. Um, and so there were definitely savings. Um, you know, as far as staff turnover, we really didn't have any. And so um, it was primarily in the capital project uh, area as you, as you surmised. Okay, I don't see any other questions. Thank you for that, Janet. And I do appreciate that there is a lot more great information in there. and. Um, we, I'm sure she'll take additional questions privately, um, but appreciate the brief report. So thank you very much. And that does bring us to the time for citizen comments. And I do have some folks here in the room, so I will start with that. Um, again, if you are on the uh, on the meeting and you'd like to speak, be sure and let Phyllis. Bowman know so that she can let me know when it's time to get there. Um, our computer, I, we, we don't have a computer this time, so public comment can come up to over, which one? Which one? Which We're one? coming up here where the uh, facing guess, the big It doesn't television matter, either screen. mic will work. Is the camera on the TV working? No, no okay. but I can actually put my, now that I'm done my presentation, I can put mine down there and then. Well, the it. vocal will be, we'll have the voice. So. The voice, the yeah. The microphone. Do so. we want to have a, do we want to have a camera? Hey. Your call. You, we'd have to sanitize your computer. That's true. Okay. So, okay. so, um, so the microphone here facing the television. So first of all, uh, we have Carol McKeel and Carol, if you'll let us know what city you reside in and Join us up here. Yeah, thank you. Here? Yeah, thanks. I know, we, we all moved this time. Remember to take my mask off this time. It's a little easier to be heard. So Carol McKeel from Monmouth. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, City Council. At the City Council meeting on June 30th, our community group presented six proposals that would begin the process of making Monmouth a safe place for all our residents. We presented two stories at the last City Council meeting. 
Today, we would like to provide another story that demonstrate that our black residents and residents of color experience harassment from the police. We hope this story helps the city council understand the critical need to make changes in our city so that everyone can feel safe. Here's the story. Can, can you hear me okay in the microphone? Yes, okay. they can hear you online. As one of very few black residents, I face racism every single day. The cops are no exception to this racism. The Monmouth police in particular have racially profiled, harassed, and discriminated against me because of the way I look. I am a college graduate, contribute to my community through charity events, and love my small town. Unfortunately, no amount of good or positive can protect me from racism. I have had a gun pulled on me for routine traffic stops by Monmouth police, who later the officers did not recall pulling their guns out. I could go on and on about specific incidents, but what good would that do? I am exhausted and tired of trying to prove racism is real in our town and it affects people of color. I am tired of police justifying their racist acts or denying them altogether. It is time that we move past awareness and into action. Thank you. And uh, Bodhi Bemrose, same thing, if you'd hear. Yes. There's quite a group out there. I promise I'll use wave at them. Oh, OK. Can you do that? They're getting antsy, and I don't want anyone to. No, we see them out there. We They're on camera. We've been able to see them. So thank you very much, everybody, for being here and waiting. <laughs> And you can take your mask off once you're seated. Okay, so it's been here. a little while since I've been here, so I need to introduce myself, right? Okay. Um, my name is Bodie Bemrose. I grew up here and I've invested my life into this community. community. And I've sacrificed a great deal to make our downtown and community a better place. Our buildings house many local businesses and residents throughout this county. But on a weekly basis now, I have residential tenants suffering from mental health issues related to the chaos, rampant shaming, and increased government control over our lives. Small businesses already struggling to get through COVID-19 are now being harassed by the BLM movement shaming and making threats in person, on the phones, and on social media, all in an effort to shame and destroy their businesses. And then we are greeted at the intersections by educators and professors that actually live here with intimidating signs that read, white silence is violence. And now, from what I understand, is that you are considering their demands to defund the police and conduct racial profiling surveys upon our citizens. Is this supposed to bring peace and awareness? Is this supposed to improve race relations? So what's really going on here? Well, for me to know the answer to this, all of us need to start having serious discussions about an ideology behind all of this. We all know that behind all forces of life, there is an ideology, some good, some bad. The ideology that governs us is critically important those who fail to learn from history are doomed to repeat it, and our founding fathers knew this. This is why they created a true form of self-government, maximum freedom for all citizens in that nation, regardless of your race or creed. We are here tonight, and those people out there are here tonight, to support and defend our policemen and women. Why we believe in law enforcement, the United States of America was founded I'm going to keep going just yep, so you know. That's fine. You have a minute. Okay. The United States of America 
the principles of liberty, justice, rule of law, law enforcement is essential to preserve our freedom and we reject any assault on the men and women of law enforcement. In 1776, John Adams spoke of the Republic as an empire of laws and not of men and the American Republic would be a nation conceived on the basis of individual liberty and the rule of law, not upon the emotion, not upon the emotional whims of tyrants. Our brave women and men risk their lives every day to maintain a civil society. Our law enforcement, our police, they, they preserve both democracy and decency, and they protect the national treasure we call the American dream, and no one is gonna take that away from us. I'm a history guy, but it doesn't take much reading for one to discover what happens when you remove law and order. The locals are forced to take things into their own hands. Do you think our common citizens are trained in de-escalation tactics? when a threat is present? Do you think your neighbor, when he or she feels threatened, has the patience, the skills, and body armor to react like a trained police officer? I know they don't. And history will, will reveal that when common citizens cannot rely on law enforcement to protect them, the common citizen will remove the threat immediately and forcefully and ask questions later. Do you know what the word vigilante means? Let me read what Webster says. A member of a self-appointed group of citizens who undertake law enforcement in their community without legal authority, typically because legal agencies are inadequate. This is human nature and we know this. We do not want this. We will not allow our nation to become like others that have failed. The most horrific reality of these nations that lost their freedom was the number of deaths committed by the hand of governments upon their own people. And those death statistics are always led by the Marxist communists. I quote, the only thing necessary for triumph of evil is that good men do nothing. If you support law enforcement, we will back you. We must defend the men and women who keep our neighborhoods safe. So like BL, hang on here, but like BLM movement, that I know they've get, they have a lot of demands for you guys. We have some requests and demands of our own. We want to increase the budgets to accommodate the following. To educate the public with a better understanding of the realities of policing in the 21st century, especially now, more than ever. Number two, to educate the public on the unique needs of the American law enforcement officers. Our policemen and women have very difficult jobs and they face harsh realities that we never see. I'll provide, number three, provide support and challenges and, and to, accurately go against anti-police rhetoric, polluting the trust of our citizens towards our brave men and women. Number four, offer news and analysis that educates every citizen on the latest issues relevant to the safety of our community. And number five, uphold and defend the Constitution of the United States of America. And this is a big one for all of us. All of you, law officials and our leaders have signed and sworn to defend the Constitution of the United States. If any of you believe in or are pushing for a different government ideology that is in direct conflict of our freedoms and the Constitution, I hate to say this, but I think you need to resign. We need you, we need you to be honest. We need you to be honest to all of our citizens. We need to know what you believe in. Cease, I've always liked you. You've been great. 15 years ago, I started working on these old buildings and you rooted me on and I appreciate that. Still do, buddy. And I've worked hard to make all you guys look good and it's been fun. And I, I, I really wish we were having a debate about um, whether we can connect the Ash Creek bike path. You know, but those, I miss those days. But today, in our society and what's going on in our nation, it's real, people are scared, and we need to join together. We cannot divide each other anymore. We have to pull this around. So the only other question I have, Cease, is I wrote a letter to you and John McArdle, and I copied our police chiefs when I read the community letter that said you guys were gonna have meetings with community <laughs> leaders to improve race relations. And I don't know why you guys didn't respond to me or invite me to those meetings. 
And I hear, I don't know for sure, I hear through the grapevine that you guys are having private meetings without law enforcement involvement. You're not having community involvement, but these meetings are with the Black Lives Matter movement. And I, I just, I don't know why. So, and I will be glad to talk to you about that separately, Bodhi, because we don't typically respond at public comment. Sure. I think I've mentioned multiple times in in this group um, that that is the, the, the meeting, the mayor's round table is regarding a wide variety of issues. It is not a meeting with Black Lives Matters organizers. It is a meeting with community volunteers, yeah. including those working on education, homelessness, um, food insecurity. We've got a, lot, a wide variety of volunteers in that meeting, mm -hmm. um, and the issues are wide ranging. So sure. it is not focused specifically on law enforcement. And there will be opportunities for more people to engage. And I think um, definitely I, I will be glad to talk to you separately about some other things, I, but just I, to let you know about that. I appreciate that. And I also want to clarify and emphasize that the tone in my voice is not necessarily my own. It is the tone of my tenants, my coworkers, contractors, regular folks here in this town. And I'm just trying to portray to you to get the message across that people need to be heard. And they love this nation, they love their freedoms, they love this community. And number one, um, these people that love this nation are from all nationalities. We are a diverse group of people and we absolutely reject racism. We absolutely reject discrimination and we won't stand for it. We absolutely will not, but we cannot drive a wedge and now start segregating people by race again. That's what's going on. Okay. So, so anyway, thank you very thank much. You. I appreciate the time. And I'll I'll check Bodie of uh, typically Phyllis may ask to have some of that in writing for the record since it was extensive. I'll check back with you thank on you. that as well. Thank you. Um and Terry Richards, did you have something to add to that? I'll give you um, mentions the same topic, so if you oh could... yeah, I think it's the same topic. <laughs> Hi everybody, I'm Terry Richards, and I've had a Monmouth and Independence address since our family moved here in 1948. So we're not going to move. Um, I heard about this organization about a week ago, uh, and I was concerned. Then, and I'm really concerned now with what's been going on in our nation and in, in our state. Uh, I have a lot of faith that you and the council and the mayor and, this, and everyone has enough Thomas pain in you. And I'm sure you do that, you know, Anything that uh, would defund the police is 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 ludicrous. Look what's happening in Portland. It's just absolutely. I'm embarrassed of our state or what's going on. It's ridiculous. Um, I'm a veteran. I'm a disabled veteran. I served our country. And on July 26, 1968. When I got out of the army, I was accosted by protesters. I'll never forget it. And I'll never forgive them. I'm a businessman. I'm retired. I've written thousands of paychecks and I've written my name on the front paychecks, not the back. We can't let our communities like this go down a rabbit hole. We have to be fiscally responsible to everyone involved. And it's somebody else's turn to talk now. Thank you, Terry. You bet.
um, that's what all we have here in the in the room. Um, Phyllis, you have uh, at least one written comment to share with us. And do we have other people on the line who would like to speak? No one has talked to me in the chat group. I just have the one let letter that was sent in by Nan Willis. All right, go ahead with that. So this is citizens comment regarding stormwater utility fees. The council has approved a water rate increase and a power and light increase totaling customers about $6 a month or $72 a year. During the budget process, it was stated that without a three to 5% increase in water and electrical rates, none of the council priorities would take place. The council chose the higher 5% figure so we can assume there's plenty for the city to do. But no, the city now needs a stormwater utility fee. What is the appropriate level of service for stormwater? According to the consultants, when I heard them speak, $11.25 was a status quo proposal and $16.94 was a proactive proposal. Is proactive the new necessary, a euphemism for going above and beyond providing basic services? I do believe the council is tone deaf to either rate increase. The burden of property taxes in Oregon is well known. From 2015 to 2020, these have increased by 4.2% a year. During that same period, the medium change in utility rates was 6% a year. Along with property taxes, Oregon ranks as the third highest income tax state at 9.9%. California is 13.3% and Hawaii is 11%. While there is no general sales tax, sales and gross receipts and fees contribute to 24% of the state budget. Oregon citizens pay plenty for services. Now the city wants money in addition to its $72 per year for utilities, anywhere from $135 to $203 for stormwater fees. Here's an attempt to improve your hearing. The percent of family budget that goes to housing has risen 30 to 40% today. Oregon's poverty rate is 12%. This means that utility increases for about 1,200 people in Monmouth would be an outright hardship. And this doesn't even speak to the working poor. While I appreciate that council members receive no pay, I would hazard that none of the council members fall into either of these two groups. During the budget process, it was shared that stormwater utility rates varied from a low of about $5 per month to a high of about $17 per month in Salem. Corvallis rates are $9.29 per month. When did Monmouth get such a big ego to set rates at $11 to $17 per month? Are you suggesting that after decades of good stewardship and conservative spending, Monmouth's infrastructure is so poor that we now must play catch up compared to other cities? The mayor has stated that raising the rates is the only way to pay for what needs to be done. What needs to be done? Provide services or provide proactive service? It's good to be proactive when you have the time, money, and resources, but the proactive rate increase assumes that money is readily available from citizens who are dependent upon utilities. Can the council rationalize that public input for this increase was genu genuinely achieved? I hope that the council makes bold and breaks set from the oh so wise consultants that have been hired to affirm what they think the council wants to hear about the new and improved revenue stream. In my opinion, the council can set the stage now by setting the rate below those recommended. That would be a clear demonstration of your ability to listen. You may certainly take the money and run now. However, citizens may turn out to be equally tone deaf to the city's need for a new city hall in the future. Thank you for your time. Dan Willis, Monmouth, Oregon. All right. Thank you, Phyllis. So no other comments submitted. All right. Just Thank a moment. Very much. Oh, I think. Um, OK, I guess not. There were just a couple comments in the chat that aren't people that want to comment. And those are recorded. Again, um, all of these comments are part of our public record and are actually, reviewed. Actually, and 
I would like to comment on the one that left the, the message. Uh, okay, go ahead and introduce yourself, your name and the city where you reside, please. And then. Yes, my name is Felix Oliveros. Yes, my name is Felix Oliveros. I'm a resident of Monmouth. I was born in Salem and grew up in Independence. I just want to state for the record, I am a Marine Corps veteran. I served my country. I love my community. I love our police officers and what they do for us every day. And I, for the record, just want to stand and say that I do believe in the Black Lives Matter movement. And there are veterans that do support that movement. And I would be happy to talk to anyone uh, about that and how this movement is not meant to divide people. It is meant to bring us together and to understand each other. That's all I would like to say. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, we have one item of business this evening before we adjourn to our work session. And so we will go ahead and hear from our community development director, Suzanne Duffner, on an agreement. Okay, good evening, Madam Mayor, members of the City Council. Um, again, my name is Suzanne Duffner. I'm the City of Monmouth Community Development Director. And you have before you this evening uh, a draft development agreement for Phase 8 of the Edwards Edition uh, Planned Unit Development. Uh, the request is to, for Council to authorize the City Manager to enter into a development agreement upon substantial completion of the public improvements for uh, the subdivision. Um, the city just recently received a request from the developer, Edward er, Eric Olson of Edwards Edition, uh, to uh, enter into this agreement. Um, this is based on uh, a couple of different uh, local and state laws. The state legislature recently uh, passed a bill which allows the developer of a subdivision to submit building permits to begin construction of um, the residential dwellings in that development once the uh, public improvements have been substantially completed, uh, provided that the developer do enter into an agreement to complete the remaining improvements uh, for the subdivision. Um, so we also have language in our city code that authorizes um, kind of this deferral, temporary deferral of some of those uh, subdivision improvements. Uh, we do require uh, council to approve the agreement, hence the reason um, it's before you this evening. Uh, and it also needs to be secure, have some kind of financial uh, guarantee or secure uh, in case the developer does not complete those improvements, then the city can uh, step in and make sure that those improvements are completed. So um, you do have a, a, the draft attached in your report in your packets this evening. Um, there are some a couple of pieces that are highlighted that we'll need to fill in uh, the city staff working with the developer on that to get this specific list of improvements that haven't been completed. So all the major improvements, the, the water, the sewer lines will be there. It's more of the finishing uh, work that would be kind of on that, um, we call that the punch list of remaining items that need to be done. Uh, so that will be forthcoming along with an estimate of the cost to improve, to complete those improvements and um, the draft final plat will get included as an attachment to that exhibit. So we have had uh, the city attorney review that and comment on it. Um, you have three alternatives before you this evening. You can authorize the city manager to enter into that development agreement once it's been finalized. Um, you could uh, make some amendments to the draft development agreement or take no action on it. Um, noted in the report that there really are no direct financial implications to the city because it, the agreement will be secured with uh, a financial guarantee. So in case those improvements haven't been completed, the city can um, step in with that guarantee to complete those improvements. So um, there is a sample motion also included in your report. And with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you, Suzanne. Any questions about this? We recently completed a somewhat similar agreement with the developer in order to allow them to 
continue on with some of their work partially complete, but this looks to be a much more extensive option um, specified in a recent piece of legislation. So something new to us to um, provide such an extensive agreement to uh, continue. And again, we're not this, we are uh, authorizing this Chad to enter into negotiations and to continue to refine this based on sort of the, the things to fill in. And if I, if there are no questions, then I would entertain the suggested motion. All right, I'll make that motion. And thank you for helping us out, Suzanne, with that. Um, I move to authorize the city manager to sign and enter into a development agreement for the Edwards Edition Phase 8 subdivision upon substantial completion of the required subdivision improvements. Second. It has been moved by Councillor Sharmer and seconded by Councillor Bell, so I think it was, to um, enter into this agreement. Is there any further discussion? All in favor of the motion, please signify by saying aye. 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 And any opposed? Seeing none, the motion carries unanimously. Thank you very much. So, uh, if, if we're ready, I think we can continue on with our agenda rather than taking a break. Um, yep. As long as my speaker here is ready, and we have uh, some folks on the line joining us to discuss our work session agenda item. Uh, which is the new city hall schematic design moving forward in that process so thank you madam mayor um council members and i'd like to first uh, thank ffa for being patient um we uh, had some technical difficulties when we started uh, the meeting and so we're running a little bit behind but thanks for staying with us on on this um so Basically, we'll just uh, have FFA take over. I, the only um, introductory comment that I want to make is um, there's been a lot of work that's been done uh, by the consultant and city staff behind the scenes, and I did believe it was an appropriate time to bring the uh, final draft design and the cost estimates to the council for a, uh, a status report and a check to see what it is. We do have the cost estimates, um, so we will review that. And Janet and I have also discussed funding options. And the intent is not uh, for any uh, final decisions. Uh, it's to brief the council and then to solicit input into next steps. Uh, but uh, again, this is we're not looking for the council to take action tonight, but we do want to uh, review the project and, and get some feedback on it. So with that, uh, Troy, I will turn it over to FFA. Thanks very much, Chad. Appreciate the opportunity to uh, present uh, where we are with the schematic design um, effort. And uh, I'm here today to present along with uh, team members, uh, Richard Grace, uh, and uh, Joe Malvo. Um, we're going to do a little backtracking, uh, a little bit of review of where we've been, and then we're going to discuss uh, uh, the design uh, as it's been developed so far and uh, finish off with uh, reviewing the um, cost estimate. Phyllis, so, would you be able to have the screen? Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> so, um, Madam Mayor and Honorable Council Members, can, can you all see this graphic? 
Okay. Is it big enough for you to read? <laughs> Okay, so we'll we'll go ahead. the The pages are in different orientations, but we'll go ahead um, with this. So, Joe, could you forward, please? So, a little bit of history. Um, uh, FFA was hired to um, look at uh, essentially a feasibility study last year of what a new city hall approach might look like, and we started really at ground zero at that point. Um, looking at a number of options for um, um, replacement of existing facilities wholly or in part with the new facility. And we vetted those options from a functional point of view uh, and a cost point of view. And we also worked with staff to develop a program of required spaces for the uh, city hall. That option study was completed um, about a year ago now. Um, and we had some very basic uh, diagrams, uh, had a preliminary cost estimate, which uh, wasn't as complete or well vetted as the one we have now. Um, the major uh, element that came from that phase one study was the determination that the best approach was to uh, look at options, further design options for a new city hall structure that combined the functions that are in the current city hall and uh, volunteer hall. <clears throat> so one of the things then that, that uh, the city asked us to do when we were looking at this was a more worked out uh, design, which would better reflect how the site could be redeveloped. And it would also uh, allow us the opportunity to engage the public for more detailed input about how the citizens of Monmouth felt uh, the city hall should be, what should the influences be, what were important elements of it. And we had two of those uh, meetings. We had three in our plan, but COVID-19 stepped in and altered that a little bit. Um, but we got good input from the two meetings that we did have in January and February. And so we've incorporated that into our considerations. So the schematic design um, uh, scope of work includes uh, vetting the actual building code, zoning, developing site plans, floor plans, and other detailed drawings, but creating a real um, preferred option of design, um, one which incorporates all the input we've gotten, and um, um, input from engineers um, so that we have narratives and better inform uh, the cost estimate. Joe, next, please. So the project goals, uh, these are a um, uh, development of those goals that we started to talk about last year. Uh, so these goals are important to keep in mind as we walk through the design. Number one, the project should help facilitate a strong connection between City Hall, Main Street, and Main Street Park. Um, the building should be right-sized for Monmouth. Um, this is very important when it comes to just the square footage of the building, but also the massing of, of the proposal. Building should be functional, efficient, and sustainable. This is a long-term investment in a facility that will likely serve the city for not just decades, but for generations. The court and council chamber should be a flexible environment that can convert between uses while remaining functional and uh, that the security needs of both programs are met. And then last but not least, the building should be an asset to the community. Next. So before um, we describe this in detail, uh, I just wanted to, in transition to other speakers, I just wanted to mention that the uh, scope of work for the project is uh, enlarged a little bit from last year in, in the site area, and that we realized that not only do we have the parking area for the city hall, but we have a parking uh, a parcel to the west that the city owns 
that is used for parking as well. And so we felt that it was important for the project scope to be complete, that we include redevelopment of that portion of city property to provide a much needed uh, parking area for the proposed new facility. And again, just to remind everyone, um, the approach here is to create a new city hall uh, facility that accommodates the city hall um, public service and office functions, um, as well as uh, municipal court space, um, spaces for court staff. And uh, that court space then doubles as the city council chamber as well. Uh, this proposal obviously then proposes to uh, remove the existing city hall and volunteer hall both in order to redevelop the site. So with that, um, Joe and Richard, if you would uh, go ahead and take off and uh, describe in a summary fashion what we've got going with the design proposal. Sure, uh, I'll walk through the floor plan layout. Uh, before I do, just uh, it's, so it's worth noting the building is divided into uh, the court city council chamber element on the uh, east side of, of the L and then the other portion is uh, and that the court city council chamber uh, part is one story and then the uh, more business function uh, city portion uh, is two story. So here we have a first floor plan, uh, north being up. So um, there's a, uh, a bar in the middle where you can enter from Main Street uh, on the top or parking uh, on the bottom of, of the screen. Uh, and that area has the a lobby and essentially the, the core and circulation between the floors. So, um, to Joe, the, maybe if you could point out with your arrow um, sure that thing. main circulation spine, that would help. Sure thing. Uh, yeah, that's that's that circulation is here. Here's the, here's the entrance on Main. Uh, here is the entrance uh, where you would enter if you parked in the parking lot. Um, so on this side of the space, we have the council courts and their associated functions. Uh, this, the space here uh, accommodates, just as it's, as it's set up here, uh, 96 seats uh, in, the, um, in this area. And then we have, we have presenters and the dais uh, in the back. Um, we also have extensive glazing and this can open up to, to outside. Um, this portion of the building, we have um, various rooms to support the, the court and council uh, storage. And then there's also a um, point of access and a, and a counter counter here for the clerk. So this, this can be um, uh, sort of a, a closed off portion if need, if need be. Um, and back in the other side of the building, we have generally uh, finance uh, offices here with an, with an open uh, desk space, uh, counter sp space to the uh, public entry. And uh, on the south end of that part of the building, we have uh, sort of general use rooms, a meeting room, uh, break room, uh, some, some technical space. In the in the core, uh, we have a we have stair, uh, an elevator, and this is repeated on both floors. Um, we have a public toilet. Uh, this this toilet is for uh, city use back here. Uh, technical, just electrical room, and a janitor space, uh, janitor closet that is accessible from the lobby. There's also a second. And a uh, second stair in the back, uh, in the back here for egress. Uh, going to the second floor, uh, we have stairs up to uh, 
lobby similar to the first floor we we tried to maintain the the uh the circulation bar here and it's uh it does show up in the the fenestration on the front and back um and how, kind of how the space is used the uh the north portion of this floor is a city manager city recorder uh, space, meeting rooms, um, storage for those spaces, and other support space. Uh, the city recorder did request a bunch of storage, so we have we have um, given her that. Uh, we have a toilet for the public up here, a toilet for uh, city employees, and uh, on this end of the space, community development and uh, building offices and open space for employees um, helping in those areas and there is a layout counter uh, here on this floor to work with the public um, between the space and the lobby uh, also on the second floor there's this door to a terrace for employees to uh, have a break and so this this is out on the uh, roof of the first floor space. And moving through these documents, uh, we just have a couple sections here. Uh, the floor height in this this portion are 14 feet. Uh, the court council space is 17.5. Uh, and then it's hard to do on my mouse because it's blocking, but um, the portion surrounding the Calta Court over here um, is uh, a 13 feet so that uh, you can step out from the, the second floor onto um, the roof here and we can have pavers and drainage and whatnot. So um, yeah, so these, these are just kind of giving a look at, at the space and relative relative to each other in size and uh, also we have here the stair core and elevator so with that i will uh, pass it over to richard i think one of the main considerations that uh, we got from everyone in terms of our meetings uh, from the staff as well as the community is that this building will be here for a long time, that it needs to kind of make a contribution to the character of the main street. Uh, so we, as a team, we really looked at the design of this project, that whatever we put in here for generation, that it will, it will need to anchor this site and it will make uh, a good contribution or relationship to what you have in terms of the, the pattern of the buildings that you have, the things that you have right now needs to be reinforced that this build, building will be a good neighbor. So what we've done is really make sure that we understand what you have in your main street. Uh, the first diagram that you see on top is uh, the notion of transparency in the ground floor of your buildings. Uh, there is a very definite, definitive uh, storefront uh, uh, in the ground floor of all your building in main street. We wanted to carry that through in uh, the city hall, especially the two-story volume that really uh, kind of engages the main street. The second one uh, on the middle, uh, if you look through and walk through the street, uh, you would assume that majority of the entries of all these historic buildings would be in the middle. It's actually majority of them are on the corner, which is actually part of your zoning code as well that uh, some uh, most of the entries uh, that we looked at were actually a corner entry so we we put that as part of uh, consideration when we were designing the building uh, as part of how we uh, put together the building as well as an l shape it really created a, a good interaction between the entry of the building and a public plaza in the front of the building that also relates to uh, a big giant tree that you have in the corner so uh, they kind of all reinforce each other uh, the other huge consideration is really uh, sustainability, I think, in terms of goals. Uh, 
figuring out a way to kind of have a building that uh, have good solar access, uh, the orientation that allows you to kind of control uh, daylight and have access for the building, north and south exposure is probably the best on the side you could control it and north is basically you have no glare so we have that as consideration for uh, the design of the building next one joe as i mentioned i think if you walk on the street on main street there is there is a level of patterns and rhythms and things that you see on the existing historic building and even on the smaller uh, building that contributes to the character of your city. Uh, we take those into consideration. There is uh, a lot to consider in terms of scale, in terms of proportion, in terms of the size of the windows, the shape of the windows. Majority of them are actually on the second floor in terms of kind of the patterning that happens. Every bay, when you say bay, it's like where there's a column line that happens in between. There's maybe three windows or four windows. But the proportions of the windows that you have are very vertical. You know, they are not big, expansive on the second floor. They're more of very skinny punch opening on masonries. Those are all the things that we've considered uh, to be part of what we're, uh, we designed for you for uh, the city hall. Uh, the last diagram is actually the massing of the building. If you look at the image on the bottom, uh, there's this pretty nice, contour of the buildings up and down it gets sets your rhythm a little bit and by having a, a one and a half story one story and a two story on the city hill uh, city hall it gives you a good relationship to what you have in the city and it allows you to kind of relate better to what you have the little elevation that you see in the middle on that bottom image is uh it's just a simple uh, elevation of the uh the building that we have and it Scale-wise and width-wise, and the window patterns, they re relate well to what you have uh, existing-wise in, in the main street. Next one, Joe. So this would be a view uh, across the street in main street. So you could see the two-story volume uh, that engages the street, the transparent storefront on the bottom, and you know, we're considering as well privacy for uh, the staff that are sitting there. So more than likely we would allow light and a little bit of a, a translucency, in, translucency in there, but necessarily all open for people to be peering in as you walk by. The corner entry kind of recessed in. Uh, the windows on top uh, on the second floors are smaller vertical windows that sets a little bit uh, of a rhythm, but yet, you know, the big window in the corner kind of gives you another hint that that's the entry point for the for the building. Recess back, and it's almost like having a, a, a front porch for your city hall. That plaza allows you to kind of set back a little bit. That gives you a little bit of a, uh, a security and a buffer to the main street. Uh, you know, there's a, a, a level of transparency, but yet again, privacy. But as you could imagine at night uh, when you're doing a city council meeting like this, that there's a little bit of a glow, a golden glow uh, back there with the, the wood ceiling being lit. And that whole notion of you know, your city working working hard and, and the, the community can watch it. So that, that ceremonial front porch kind of allows you to kind of have this setting that sets you up for uh, what you do uh, as a city council. Um, next one, Joe. So this would be uh, the back entry that Joe was mentioning, uh, where the parking lot would be, the court, which is this one's uh, court uh, offices to the right, and then the two-story uh, uh, office on the left. And on the ground level, you know, the same patterns uh, kind of on the the top and then and again a storefront very open on the bottom where the kind of the break room for for the staff as well as a, a conference room to the left uh, we felt that uh, especially in the exterior that there's a uh, masonry a language that you have in the city and again masonry would last for a generation in terms of material there's a level of uh, integrity and uh, uh, 
uh, again, in a material that, you know, it's really easy to maintain as well. So I think we felt that the character and the materials should really relate to what you have in the, uh, the, the, the city. Next one, Joe. We move into the inside of the, the building. Uh, this view would be looking north. That little door all the way in the back would be the main entry on Main Street. Uh, there, there would be a plaza. You get a little bit of a glimpse on the kind of the spine circulation in the middle of the building to the uh, middle of the image. And to the right would be uh, uh, the courts and the uh, city council chamber. Uh, there would be a, a stair that goes up to the second floor. Um, as you could see, we look at a material that not only uh, uh, material that gives you a little bit of warmth, uh, but it's basically the structure of the building. It's a timber structure uh, that gives you an opportunity to not use it just as structure, but always uh, also as a finish for your your building so it kind of you're not laying extra finishes for the for the building so it gives you a little bit of a sustainability point in term in terms of really utilizing the structure it's not just a structure but a finish for uh for the building next one joe so this would be the courts city council chamber and the community uh event space uh there it's very uh, well lit, very warm. Uh, it's probably a, a little bit different from Volunteer Hall in terms of what it feels like. There's a, a one and a half story height to it. There's a balance of light from the south to the right, and then uh, a big span of glass to the left that opens up into uh, a plaza when you have a big community event space that allows you to kind of open it up and have inside and outside kind of blurred and be part of one big space. Uh, again, as you can see, the structure is the finish, especially on the ceiling, the columns, and the back where the dais is. Uh, it's all uh, structural timber wood. Uh, it gives you kind of that warm glow at night, and it gives you kind of that uh, good feeling about uh, a very warm space, an inviting space. All right, um, Joe, if you could enlarge this a bit. Sure. <clears throat> okay, so um, we'll discuss the, the cost estimate as it stands right now. Uh, this is a summary cost estimate um, provided by um, our cost estimating consultant, um, which is ACC Cost Consultants. Um, we've worked back and forth with them uh, as we've finished out the schematic design uh, package to refine this estimate. And uh, we feel as though it's a, a good representation of the level of design effort that we're at at this point. Um, the overall area of the project is, uh, in terms of gross square footage is 15,171, which is actually a little bit a few hundred square feet less than we had in the very generic kind of preliminary um, planning from last year. Um, the cost, including site work, is um, estimated right now at a little over six, 7.6 uh, million. There are a couple of alternates there. One, uh, this estimate is for direct construction cost only, and it's assuming a construction start date of June of, of next year. Um, if construction uh, doesn't start until the following year, approximately March of the following year, there's an estimate there of some additional um, dollars for to account for uh, escalation. Um, there's also a uh, alternate for upgrading the brick um, uh, in the sense that right now the brick uh, appearance is very uh, is fairly subdued and not a lot of in and out and the kinds of things that cause um, the installers to take more time doing the work, you know, creating some really elaborate kinds of detailing that might reflect uh, the detailing of the historic buildings on Main Street more um, exactly. 
So there's an estimate of what it would take to do that there. <clears throat> you might ask yourself, should we have escalation in this due to our current economic circumstances? And um, that's why we have a cost estimating consultant. They're recommending that we continue to assume that there will be escalations um, as that there was a lot of, of construction work in the pipeline when COVID-19 hit and a lot of that work is continuing. So at least in the short term, uh, our estimating consultant feels as though it's wise to continue to assume that there will be escalations in the next couple of years. Um, Joe, could you go ahead to the next page, please? So this is a breakdown, which they go into excruciating detail on subsequent pages, which we won't get into, but Joe, if you could, kind of scroll up a little bit and then enlarge the bottom part where we've got below the subtotal. So this is just to show that there's a subtotal that accounts for the construction costs. And then there are other elements in this um, that typically make up what we call direct construction cost. And I'm gonna go through those things very briefly. So in addition to the subtotal amount, there's an estimating and design contingency of 10%, which is 563,000. And we've included that in there because as complete and final as these drawings that we've just presented may look, there are a lot of details about the design, engineering details, architectural details that really haven't been worked out yet. And so that's what that number is there for. Um, and it's also there in that it gives us a, a pool of fund in which we can work relative to value engineering the project, which we always need to do. And we can always find value in looking at alternatives. There's also the index to construction start of 5% that I mentioned, um, and that get, takes you to mid next year. That's 310,000 roughly. Then there's the contractor's uh, typical uh, overhead uh, and profit and con uh, general conditions, insurance, bond, et cetera. Those amounts are fairly typical in the industry and our cost estimator, um, we rely on them to put those in there properly. So that then gives us a total of 7.6 million in the estimate. And then the breakdown at the bottom of the page between the building and the site work and utilities uh, with the building being at 6.9 million, the site work at 700,000. Looking at this another way, Joe, if you could go to the next page. <clears throat> the direct construction cost is only one part of getting a project like this uh, completed. So in addition to the direct construction cost that I've just reviewed, there's also costs that we call project costs or soft costs. And those involve a number of things. They involve uh, fees from people like ourselves and our engineers and other consultants. It involves um, project contingencies that the city might be carrying, um, other fees such as fees for permitting and testing and inspections, administration, interest, and other expenses that the city may need to carry. This is an estimate of uh, that we usually carry that's a certain percentage of the direct construction cost. And uh, in this case, we've also gone to the effort to put together an estimate of what the additional architectural and engineering services would be. Um, Chad requested us do that. So within this text, there's a number there, an estimate of about 575,000 for all of the estimated architecture and engineering fees to complete the project through the end of construction that are part of this one, roughly 1,150,000 in, in uh, project or soft costs. Uh, one thing to note, uh, there are several items which um, we're unsure of at this point, and the city's unsure of at this point in the project uh, regarding whether, uh, you know, where, the staff would move to provide services while this construction happens. Would they need to lease or would they be able to uh, use a facility the city may already own? Uh, so there's leasing questions about moving and leasing costs, land acquisition costs. Those are not included. They're also um, not included here is if the city decides to pursue lead or any other recognition of a sustainability 
those costs for consultants as well as the actual certifications are not included um, in this. Uh, last element here, uh, as this would be an all new facility and the age and, and condition of the existing um, furniture, fixtures and equipment that the city has, we felt it was correct to include an estimate of costs for all new uh, F, what we call FF and E. So that to provide all new furniture, seating, office systems, um, elements for the city council chamber comes in at just under 200,000. Um, that doesn't include things like um, equipment such as computers and copiers, um, AV equipment and that kind of thing. Um, this is an element that sometimes is included if there's a bond measure uh, for uh, financing. Uh, uh, sometimes this is funded from other sources or on a yearly basis. But assuming that it might be part of a funding package overall, we thought it was important to include it. And so the, the total um, estimated project cost is uh, right around uh, 9 million at this point. So that, hey, inc that concludes our um, our presentation, and um, I'll turn it back over to to Chad. Uh, thank you, Troy. Uh, yeah, there was one there was one comment that I wanted to make uh, related to the uh, FF and E cost, the uh, one hundred ninety one thousand dollars. So that number is uh, it can flex anywhere between zero to five percent, and um, when we were looking at it, uh, originally we we had a 5% figure that we were discussing. Um, I went back to FFA and talked to them about the magnitude of that cost. Um, I thought was, you know, the, the city probably won't be looking to replace all of its furniture and equipment. Uh, some of the stuff that uh, Troy mentioned, your computers and copiers and things like that. So we included the 2.5%, recognizing that you will have to do something. There's no doubt about that. And for example, the first thing the council probably will want to do is make sure that they outfit the uh, council chambers with sufficient audiovisual equipment to ensure that you can conduct your meetings live stream in every which way that you want. Um, I participated in a project like that once, and I can tell you it's not cheap. Um, I think St. Helens spent close to $75,000 to, to outfit it. But I just, I just want to make you aware that that number can go up and down and there's time to work on it. And one thing that FFA and I talked about is we can include it in the budget. And you can also include a year or two out to kind of fill out the uh, occupancy as you move in. So there's not a urgent need to, you know, have everything perfect when you move in. You can use your uh, budgeting over a couple years to kind of fill that out and use uh, operating expenses versus debt service, for example. But the, the last point I want to make about that is you, you have options um, and it, it may not be 2.5%, um, but that's you have some control over that figure as compared to some of the other figures. Okay, that's the only comment I wanted to make and I will turn Thank it you. back over to the mayor for, I'm sure there's questions. I, I would imagine there are, so Bram. Questions, comments? Uh, Councillor Belts. Th this may seem like a, a picky or silly question, but I was looking at the public restroom on the first floor and it looks like it's just one big restroom. Is that, are we doing gender neutral restrooms now or who's that for? Yeah, the proposal right now is, um, for a, uh, it's not a gender neutral restroom exactly, it's uh, called an all user restroom. And so each of the toilet rooms is a, uh, a separate uh, space that you go in and lock the door. Um, the communal piece is where the sinks are. And this is, um, this is something that we're doing in our public buildings now. Um, 
across a number of different use types. Um, and so uh, it has um, certain advantages. And one of them is certainly on the cost side that you really are building. You have some cost to build the, the toilet rooms themselves that's above what you'd otherwise do, but you're not really having to build two complete toilet rooms. Um, and I think that as more of this is done, for various reasons, um, it will be uh, become probably the accepted way that it's done in the country. Well, it certainly, it certainly makes more sense. Um, and 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 again, people will get used to that as that becomes the norm. Thanks. You bet. Uh, this time. Other comments. I have a question. No, um, in terms of in terms of architecture, is this some um, international style? Uh, I think we like to think of it as we don't really think about working in a style per se. We really do the best we can to tune into what the community has been looking for, as well as what the city staff has been uh, asking for and looking for. Um, it's our attempt to create a public building in Monmouth style that will, you know, really stand the test of time. Um, and so it's a, it's our interpretation of what a modern building, civic building should be for the city of Monmouth that happens to be on Main Street, where we really need to relate to the existing context and scale and massing. Uh, as I mentioned, when we were looking at the cost estimate, there are ways we, we have our ways there are ways to articulate that exterior in more detail and relate it more directly to some of the historic precedents um, but we also know that the, the project needs to have a level of modesty to it and uh, ability of a reasonable budget to execute the overall project so we've kept it fairly simple but no, our, our okay, so, not okay, intended just, for it to be an international style building. Okay, I, yeah, I've been told if it looks like a big brick block, it's international style. Um, <laughs> I'm, I don't know my way around architecture, I'm sorry. Um, but in terms of those bricks, are they structural or are they just decorative? They are um, what we call a brick veneer, so they're not structural. They're okay. uh, one layer of brick on the exterior. Okay, I've had too many opportunities to see lots of bricks on the ground after an earthquake. Um, and then um, you've got some um, other costs here um, that seem kind of cut and dry. They don't, you know, the costs don't include furnishings and equipment and design fees and consultant fees. But one thing that sort of jumps out at me is that uh, what's not included is the cost for hazardous material testing and removal. and um, I think that building was built. Does anybody know the year it was built in, in the 1930s? In the 20s? 20. Yeah. Any guesses? 20. 29. 20. 1929. Mm -hmm. Okay, so there's probably a good chance that there's some hazardous materials in there, and that can jump, that can cause your cost to go up pretty dramatically pretty quickly. Um, so I think it's it wouldn't be unreasonable to think that we are probably looking at a city hall that's going to be at 10 million or more um and i boy that's that sounds like a lot of money to me um and it, in terms of earthquakes um if we're starting this um in june of next year um and there are employees who are in that decrepit old building right now will have to move is there any way we can move those now those people now chad because it just it scares me thinking of um you know that that second floor collapsing and the um people being hurt or injured in the case of a of an earthquake well, uh, yeah certainly you would have options to look at it would take you know if that was the desire of the council we could go out and take a look and come back with some options either leasing space or uh, say converting volunteer hall over covid um, unfortunately provides some opportunities yeah. for rehousing in vacant spaces but um 
for the interim, um, it would be, I, I think you, if the council so desired, you could do it, but I think you would want to have a kind of a final action that you knew you were working towards versus just uh, relocating. Okay, I think I think that would be a way for the council to show that the staff members who work there in that building um, are important to us. We care about them and we want them to be safe. Um, we live in an earthquake prone area um, and with every day that passes that we don't have an earthquake, the risk of having one increases. So um, I think those are things to, to keep in mind to protect our employees who are now working. And particularly if we have to take this on for another year, uh, pass it on for another year, um, I think it would be really important to find a place for our, our employees to, to be safe. Uh, Troy, can you address uh, the Councillor Sharmer's uh, question regarding hazardous materials? Um, partially. Uh, the, <clears throat> it's been my experience that um, removal of hazardous materials is very work intensive and time intensive when the facility that's being abated is going to be renovated or upgraded. So they have to go in there and they really have to surgically kind of remove things. Um, and when you're going to be demoing the facility like we're proposing on this project, uh, you still have to be careful and you can't let things kind of go into the air. But because you are doing a mass demo, the cost in terms of cost per square foot is typically not as much, not as high as if you're doing it piecemeal. Um, so the other thing on this project is there's quite a bit of, if it goes forward as proposed, it's quite a bit of demo between the old city hall and the volunteer hall on the site. And the, the demo contractor would have a fairly clear field and be able to do their work pretty efficiently. So I'm not sure in this case, in terms of the overall project, if the hazardous material cost would be um, a, you know, a very a, a large, large amount. And th those are the reasons why, but we're not, you know, that's not an area of, of our expertise and there. It might be uh, valuable, you know, if and when the project goes ahead to get a better handle on uh, how the demo and hazardous abatement might be done. Uh, usually the abatement contractor would go in and do their work on a, in one shot on a, buildings like this that are gonna be demoed and do it quickly and then give it over to the general contractor to have the demo contractor go in and do their work without concern about hazardous materials flying around. But to get a, a better idea of the cost on that, I think it would need to be a, a bit of a separate study to nail it down more exactly. Okay, thank you. Um, and I think we need to keep in mind that if there are hazardous materials, they aren't just trucked down to Coffin Butte. They have to be taken to specific land sites. Um, and uh, when I worked in San Francisco, uh, soil that was contaminated with oil um, had to be hauled away at $700 a cubic yard. And so it can get it can get pretty expensive pretty quickly. Yes, if you get into uh, uh, ha um, contaminated soils, yes. Uh, and they do, these type of materials do have to be handled uh, a specific way and they can only go to specific places. Yes. Thank you. Okay, great question. Others, Councillor Belts again. Um, have accommodations been made in the interior for public art or for art to be hung and displayed? Yeah, <clears throat> with um, the proposed design, there are some areas where um, we have the possibility to really have a nice kind of gallery kind of space for public artworks. Uh, there was also on the part of um, the staff team that we worked with, as well as some folks uh, who came to our public meetings, were really interested in including public artworks in the interior, and maybe even the exterior the plaza space, for example, uh, um, that were meaningful and relevant related to the history and the culture of, of Monmouth and, and the area. So like the main, 
circulation uh, space on the first floor between the north and the south main entries. It would be a really nice gallery space for um, 2D and 3D uh, artworks. And then out in the plaza would be a really great spot for three-dimensional artworks to potentially um, go. So I think there's a within this design, there's a lot of good public space that would allow for that. Um, also, the, the lobby space on the second floor would be a, a really nice home for some public artworks as well. Place for a clock tower. <laughs> That's not in the budget. <laughs> for that. Uh, Councillor Kerry. Uh, sort of to follow up on uh, Roxanne's point, is this building uh, one that would require percent for our um, installation? Does the Public. city have a percent for our program in place? Well, the state of Oregon so. does. Yeah, if 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 there is no program in the city and if the state isn't providing any funding, then there's no requirement for percent for art. Each of the university buildings are required to have that. Right. There's state state of Oregon funding for those projects, I would uh, venture to say. Yeah. I think it's something okay. we definitely should be considering, though. Yeah, yeah I concur. Um, the, the, uh, you know, I, I would have to say that uh, that I, I think the uh, design is is not is is really reflective of the discussions that we had. I think it would be congratulated all of you for putting together a very nice um, very nice layout. It seems to be a combination of function and form. Um, the, the one thing that I did wonder about is and um, it, it, and I haven't really drilled all the way down on it, but as I look at the, um, it, it's sort of the schematic, not the schematic, but the rendering inside the building looking north, um, you know, to the main street exit, entrance rather, um, that seems, you know, that, that's obviously a hallway, um, but it also serves as a, um, almost like a, uh, area where people would, because I believe if I, unless I misread the, the, the layout, that's sort of where people would come to a window and make payments on utilities and that sort of thing. Uh, is that that's correct? Right. I, I'm wondering if that would be a, a potential for a bottleneck uh, of, of transportation up and down there, uh, foot, foot traffic uh, north and south. Um, and well, like I said, it looks just kind of like a hallway that people will stop in. Uh, it's a fairly minimal criticism, but it's one that I that I wondered about. Um, and perhaps that could be assisted with furnishings or something. I I, I don't I don't know. Uh, any particular thoughts on that? I think we we provided uh, ample uh, space for circulation as well as a place for people to kind of sit right by the window as well uh, to kind of wait uh, as well as you move uh, further south where the stairs are that would serve as a circulation and a, a, an ante room for the uh, city council uh, chamber yeah. as well. So I think we've kind of created the, not just a circulation but a place for people to kind of wait and gather as well. But yeah, I think I, I, your, your concern was at the public service counter near the north entry, is that right? Bottleneck. Yeah, yeah bottleneck potentially, and, and really nothing that would, uh, you know, cause anyone to stop there. I mean, you know, I, I, I don't know. I, and it's a little tough to tell how wide that is. Uh, so I didn't know what the scale was. It may, but, you know, it could be plenty wide. Um, Joe, that's about uh, um, at the service counter. It's about uh, ten plus feet wide, isn't it? Yeah, I, I want to say the, I want to say twelve. Um, I don't that's have not, the ability to check it. I think right that now. points well taken, though, and I think that's something that that we um, would certainly want to look at. Um, 
when we uh, uh, move forward with uh, the next phase of design, uh, it might be that we'd want to look at that and look at options for maybe moving that counter a little bit to create a little more space right there. Uh, we could move it to the west a bit, possibly, um, and still have to relate to the open office area of finance and um, have enough room to work with. So I think that uh, I'm keeping track of all these questions, and I think that's certainly something we should look at in the next iteration. Yeah, I, I think uh, if I could just follow up, I think we would uh, work, you know, work with city employees and uh, figure out how that space is actually used, how many people may be gathering there, because it, it's it's a good point that we we don't want to create a, a bottleneck, especially right near the front door. Of course, the irony of this is. We're worried about something that's probably 12 feet wide, 10 at least, uh, and lots of room. And we're dealing with about 15 square feet uh, right now for people that come in and pay their bill. So <laughs> it's a bit of a, a moot point, but but it, it it might be something. Anyway, thank you for for looking at that. My final question uh, has to do with um, you know the relocation, and I'm concerned with that. Uh, I don't have a real good handle on the, the actual site map to know whether it would be possible to, um, you know, relocate our people, our, our staff people uh, into Volunteer Hall while the main building, it, you know, and so that would allow for the, dem the demo of uh, City Hall as it exists, move them into Volunteer Hall, build the new building, and then after that demo um, volunteer hall and build a parking lot. I, I don't know what the adjacencies are there and whether that would be possible because I'm concerned about, well, I think everybody is concerned about where our people are going to go for the construction time here. Um, so I'm wondering whether that would be, whether there's enough on the, on the property there for that to work. There might be. We, we um, in our first phase of study last year, we looked at Volunteer Hall. Uh, we don't have it on the site diagram, uh, the site plan right now, but it could be possible that we could keep that Volunteer Hall. Um, we'd have to look at that, where it is and the layout we're proposing and where the utilities and services and things are to see if we'd be causing a bottleneck in, in how that new city hall might get built or for causing any problems with being able to um, accommodate the new utilities and things that would be brought in. But it's, it's say blanket kind of overall, I think it could work because right now the parking we're proposing to the south of the proposed city hall is uh, where volunteer hall is right now. It, it seems to me early on when we had this conversation, the uh, new construction would not impede on volunteer hall, that we could potentially use it. Um, so again, we hadn't quite uh, explored that, you know, to death, uh, so to speak, but um, it's the footprint of a, a new expanded city hall doesn't uh, overlap onto volunteer hall. So there may be an option uh, to do that. And I think what we've talked about exploring is the other city facilities. We have some space yeah. uh, for growth in our other city facilities. And while we might want to have our utility counter fairly close to where it normally is, um, whether that's at volunteer hall or even temporarily at a senior center location, which is still very central for folks, we can relocate on a temporary basis management, for example, to uh, power and light, to, uh, you know, we can have our municipal court potentially at the police station. So, so we have some other, you know, yeah. space that could work on a temporary basis to redeploy um, and, and building and community development, you know, maybe that would work in volunteer hall. I don't know exactly, but we, we again, we could look at, mm -hmm other space options that we have and i think we can do that fairly affordably there's options yeah i, I yeah. think the other interesting thing is um every every corporation every public entity 
now knows what it's like to have folks work from home. So that was an option that certainly we, you know, might have been more hesitant to explore um, in in pre-COVID days, but it gives us a lot more flexibility. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. Uh, that's all for my questions. Thank you. Thank you. We, uh, Something else, or was that Spike's tail or Zoe's tail? <laughs> Chris Lopez. <laughs> Hi, Zoe. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Madam Mayor, and hello, Zoe. Um, I have a question regarding the uh, the um, uh, environment and any eco-friendly initiatives um, that have been built into the building. Of, during the design phase, I know the south-facing windows were mentioned, um, but uh, but I'd, I'd be curious if there was anything else uh, specifically taken into account. Yeah, one of the things that we we like to do um, with our projects is to orient them, and I think you're uh, alluding to this. Um, we like to orient uh, as much of the long faces of the building to the north and the south as possible because that's ideal for um, um, sustainable passive sustainable design options. Here, it's a variation on the theme because we really needed to also address Main Street and do so in a, in a form and in a scale that was appropriate. So here we've oriented a lot of the building with the long side facing south, but part of it's also facing west. But that was because of the historic context on Main Street. Uh, the other aspect of this is that we have um, some fairly large roof areas where we would be able to uh, look at a photovoltaic uh, uh, installation. And the orientation of those roofs is uh, really works nicely for that and because they are proposed as low slope roofs uh, we have some very recent experience in in installing um, uh, designing for and in, and coordinating and design of uh, the arrays and uh, so I guess that that's one of the things we're looking at Something else that's uh, indicated, um, we always try to maximize the efficiency of the uh, mechanical systems that we specify for the building. Um, and we have, um, you know, our outdoor space that we propose, the terrace. Um, there could be some green roof areas there potentially. I think looking at our recent projects, though, we get the most um, benefit from active systems like photovoltaic arrays. Um, uh, we can also do things like look at that photovoltaic array uh, layout and, uh, and um, install infrastructure for them to be installed later. Um, uh, there are programs out there as well for um, entities such as the city can apply for programs that provide funding to install systems like that. Um, we're just finishing the Beaverton Public Safety Center in Beaverton, um, and it has a, a very large photovoltaic array that is helping um, to keep that building powered up and running in a severe emergency where all power is lost. And um, uh, that system was installed uh, because of a PGE grant program that they were able to uh, successfully apply for. So I think this project um, has some of those potentials um, built in kind of to the scheme that we're looking at. Additionally, uh, Troy, the, the, um, the construction of the building itself, uh, we've proposed uh, CLT cross laminated timber. So that's in the uh, floor uh, and the roof, and then in some of the wall structure. So that's uh, a sustainable wood product and uh, quite possibly from within, uh, what would it be, within 200 miles of uh, Monmouth? 
Yeah, the like mass that. timber um, systems um, that we're proposing here are ones that we've been increasingly looking at from design perspective. And we've finished several projects in the last few years that incorporate these systems. And uh, they have a number of advantages that we've talk, talked to a little bit here. And um, I think that that is a, that is a, a non-active but built into the fabric of the building kind of sustainable design approach. And I think you have one in the university that's a, a good example of that one. I think it's a wall to the stair, I believe. And there is a good story on the timber uh, carbon sequestration as well as part of the story that you could tell on the sustainability side. So the embodied energy of using wood instead of steel and concrete is a, a good way to kind of look at it sustainability wise as well. So. Can Thank I just, I... just add, oh, are you done first? Are you oh, finished? Yes. Please go ahead. Just, I was just going to say that my house is designed to accommodate solar panels on the roof. And when it was finished, I got an estimate for that. And it was about $25,000. And then I looked at my monthly Monmouth Power and Light electric bill, which was $25. And I thought, you know, I think it's going to take me 100, 100 years to see any return on this investment. And uh, uh, Monmouth doesn't participate in the Oregon Energy Trust because we have our own little um, utility. And so we don't get any tax breaks if we uh, if we put in solar panels. So, but but that said, it's always a good idea to think of the environment first and that kind of passive solar uh, electricity is a good thing to be thinking about now and in the future. So unless there are other comments about this phase, uh, the next thing we have to talk about this evening is the money part. So um if think, we're ready to move to that so, so janet's going to try to pull that up on yeah the phyllis if you can make me presenter please and do we want to keep our architects on for further input on that or can we let them go yeah i um i guess unless you're super interested in how we make sausage uh, troy and <laughs> Richard Joe, and Joe, Richard, yeah. <laughs> you guys are free to go. Um, but I do appreciate the work you, you guys have put into the project. It, it's really, uh, I think it reflects, you know, certainly the downtown business district and uh, it's very attractive and functional. Yep, it's amazing. Got a couple of comments in the chat, even from folks who are appreciative of what we're trying to do and how it does reflect Monmouth um, very much so. So thank you, gentlemen. Appreciate that. And we're not done with you. We'll see you again in, in future steps, but this is exciting. Thanks. It is indeed. And it's it's really been a pleasure for us to uh, work for the city and, and interface with your community to further the vision for this project. And um, I think that the main thing that we're trying to do is create a design that um, has a very high value component um, because uh, this will serve the city for a long, long time and it holds an important place in downtown. So with that, um, thanks again to all of you um, for having us continue. And thank you for all of your questions. And we look forward to the next, uh, the next phase of this. Thanks, Troy. Thank you very much. Thank you. Have a good evening, everybody. Thanks. Thank you. In the council's packet, there's a memorandum from Janet and myself, um, and I'll just kind of do the <laughs> intro, and then you can you can make Janet run the gauntlet. Um, the first page, uh, talking about background, basically just is intended to outline the uh, types of financing sources that you could use on this type of capital project. And the first one is uh, that uh, special capital reserve. So uh, if you remember during the budget, um, and I can't speak prior to the budget, there is money in reserves for the city hall project that the uh, city is currently using to 
pay for the work that's being done by FFA. And if I remember right, the magnitude of that number currently is about four hundred thousand dollars. Right. Okay. So that's what the city has done in the in the past. Now this first one, though, you'll remember in the budget, each of the uh, the funds, water, sewer, power and light, building fund, and the general fund, all made contributions to reserves that totaled approximately a million dollars. So, and, and based, they were prorated, so it wasn't an equal distribution, but it was prorated uh, based on... Uh, on their total budgeted expenses. Total budgeted expenses. Okay. So the intent of that, and I remember the, the question, but the intent of that is over a two year period was to build up a reserve equal to about $2, $2 million. So that's, that. when I talk about the special capital reserve, that's the um, that's what we're talking about. The rationale for that is that each of the enterprise activities, water, sewer, uh, street fund, power and light, building, they all require the um, city operations. So the city hall, they rely on the city manager's office, finance office, and so on to uh, perform part of their uh, duties and their functions. So it's from an equity standpoint, it's fair for the, the, those funds to contribute to the city hall project. Um, I guess to some extent you could always start to parse through the percentages and the numbers, but uh, in essence, I'm just talking about the uh, a, a fair contribution from each of the enterprise activities to the project. Uh, the other three items are are just pretty understandable. There's the issuance of full faith and credit uh, via bank loans, the issuance of general obligation, which I think historically is the most traditional I, uh, type of financing that you use for large uh, general purpose capital facilities, um, city halls, parks, uh, you used it for the police facility and so on. And then the last item is the urban renewal district um, uh, contributing some funding to the project. So those are kind of just the 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 ideas, the uh, places you can go and think of. Now there can be nuances, and you can massage these things to be uh, more and less. Um, but those are kind of the the four pots that you're looking at. So then I asked Janet to take a look at, okay, so what what alternatives does the city council have to look at? This is on the second page. And again, think of this just in terms of magnitude. This isn't, um, we, didn't, we didn't go through uh, the numbers in any great detail. We just said, let's look at four options. Certainly there can be more um, options than the four, but, we said, let's just look at the magnitude of what it could look like. So the first three are all talking about the use of general bond, but to a greater and lesser degrees. So the first one, a geo bond large, this, uh, this option relies heavily on a geo bond. So if you have a $9 million project, for example, um, I have to remember, don't forget that you have, you have these others there that are going to contribute Two million dollars from special reserves, probably some urban renewal dollars that we, on the project sheet, we um, identified at 2.25 million dollars. Okay, so just remember, there's those there to talk about, but but the balance would be done uh, using some type of geo amount, and for this, we looked at five million dollars as just kind of a magnitude number. So that's a large geo contribution. Median contribution was less, so you would increase the other contributing or contributing. You you would look at the other contributing um, um, funds, financial mechanisms, increase those, and reduce your geo obligation bond that you put out to um, to the electors. So, for example, we would reduce the geo bond from five to three million dollars and increase the other two equally uh, between the special reserves and the urban renewal contribution. The urban renewal contribution, by and large, isn't really an issue that you uh, would have to 
be concerned with too greatly at this point, um, other than it would affect some of the projects on uh, that spreadsheet that I provided to the council. The one that you, what, the one that would have impact with the city is using the internal uh, special reserves. So the contributions from water, sewer, power and light, street fund, and building fund. So the longer their contributions go on, the uh, less um, capital they have for other activities, and it obviously uh, will have some impact on rate. So as that goes up, impact over on uh, those operations is greater, general obligation goes down, um, and the urban renewal is, is, I just am kind of looking that as a residual uh, um, bucket that you would, they would contribute to. And yes, it would have an impact on projects, but um, it would be less apparent uh, to the public for sure. Um, the small ones, so now you're looking at a small geo bond of $1.25 million as an example. And again, you're increasing the internal contributions to $4 million and the urban renewal contribution to $4 million. So again, you're still going out for a geo bond. Um, there's some uh, strategery, I've always liked that word, um, that goes into how you put a bond out to on the ballot, um, because at least my experience has been that geo bonds are really not very successful, especially for a city hall project. Um, city halls are boring. They, you pay money um, you, that you don't want to pay to those. They don't sizzle like a municipal pool, for example, and what? athletic facilities and things that have uh, engaged the community more in. Uh, in more pleasurable activities. So you would look at something small. The last one is, okay, what would it look like if we didn't rely on a GL bond at all? So again, you're, you would try to build up your internal reserves, um, such as what we're doing now. It would take, probably you would have to defer the construction out uh, some period of time to build that reserve up, but maybe a year or two um, so you would have some additional costs that would come on. If you remember alternative uh, one that was presented by FFA had a, a deferral cost um, of putting it off. So you would have to build that up and you would have to contribute more from your urban renewal agency. And probably I think you would go out and secure a loan uh, I can't speak to what the loan would look like, but let's assume it's a full faith and credit type of loan. And over whatever term that would be, so again, a 10 year to 20 year term, I'm a short term guy, um, if you can do it, because I don't like paying interest just like anybody else. And you, would, you have demonstrated that the uh, enterprise funds can contribute funds to this, so they would just be uh, making uh, the, the debt service payments on, on your loans over a period of time. I think, again, that's a, a viable option. And um, th the, the downside of that is, of course, you're, you're committing, at least in the short term, uh, you're committing some department activities, you know, that they would prefer to use the money on something else than helping to build a city hall. Um, that's probably, you have that competition that's going on uh, for for the money from the departments, but, you know, certainly you would be able to create a, a revenue stream, a, a debt service uh, stream to pay the debt off. And you've already demonstrated that you can do that um, because we have the first year going into reserve of a million dollars towards a $9 million project. If you pull the trigger now, You'd probably have department heads wanting to meet with you personally at your house to talk to you about the, that idea. But it's, I think it's an idea that you could you could uh, you could do if you uh, if you really kind of wanted to knuckle down and and bear it for a five to ten year period. But uh, but again, you have the urban renewal agency that's going to kick in. So let's say under that option. 
you said, well, the agency kicks in half of the project at four and a half million dollars. In two years, you're going to have two million dollars um, from contributions, and you have a four hundred thousand dollar in reserve currently. You're pretty close to being home. I, I mean, to me, looking at it, I, I, I certainly, even though nine million dollars is a big number. We haven't talked about value engineering. We haven't talked about the facade. You know, do you want brick? It's going to cost extra. You're going to have people that are going to talk to the council and say, well, I could build that for half a million dollars. Uh, believe me, I've heard it many times. They can't, but they think they can because their house only cost them $350,000. So, you know, how hard can it be? Um, but you haven't talked about value engineering. You haven't talked about um, some of the particulars, you know, that you would do in the next phase as you go to final design. Um, but depending on how much you want to use your urban renewal agency to contribute to the project, I think you're, um, I think you're, it's it's viable. And that's that's all I have. I can answer questions or Janet. Can I, I kind of I hogged all I the attention there for. Sorry. Quick, sorry, Laurel. Go ahead. <laughs> um, is it pretty much accepted that um, we would put at least part of this out to the ballot for a general obligation bond and the no-go, I like that, the no-go option is um, would only be used if the bond is not approved by the voters? Is that right? I, I, we haven't made that uh, determination as to which. We were just trying to provide you with options, okay. and I thought it was okay. important to demonstrate. I thought it was important to demonstrate to the council that there there is an option to uh, to go without a general obligation bond. Now it might be a little painful to some of your departments, um, but I can't. I wouldn't. I would not feel that I had done due diligence if I didn't at least outline that as an option. And I think, again, none of this includes the cost we just asked about, relocation, leasing, renting, all those things. So those aren't things you can easily finance. Those are things typically you do have to come uh, from reserves to, to build that part into it. But uh, and Janet I and then... I just wanted to add something more. I think it is important for us to uh, to keep in mind that before COVID, um, there were two bond issues on the ballot that were turned down. One was for um, improving the county fairgrounds and the other was for improving um, the county courthouse. And um, while the voters are usually pretty willing to um, approve bonds for law enforcement, first responders, they're not usually so crazy about um, having their property taxes go up to pay for um, things like city halls. Um, so, but it, it's encouraging to see that, that if a bond issue is not approved by the voters, that we still have a way of making this happen. So thank you for that. Janet? The only thing actually I would add is that uh, a general obligation bond is very much, as Chad said, a traditional way to finance these. And one of the, the pros for it, um, you know, as far as, as talking about a general obligation bond in this context is that, uh, you know, a, a new building is needed. And, and so, as Chad said, the value engineering can still go on. Um, the price tag is big, but a general obligation bond, um, you know, is something that Civic Pride can, uh, they can have part of that building as well. Um, and the fact that otherwise it's going to tumble down on, <laughs> speaking for my staff and I, tumble down on us in the 9.0 or maybe sooner. Um, you know, I think there's a lot to be said for, for having that buy-in from the public. Um, um, it's, it's much more obvious through a general obligation bond than it is through self-financing. Um, and it and it sort of gets that 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 uh, that opportunity for uh, the citizenry to take pride in the building um, if you know if it can be built in a, in a cost effective way and and result in a functional yet beautiful um, building. And you, you do have support from the I/O. If you remember, there was an editorial that supported the uh, replacement the new building to come on and. 
Janet and I have had this discussion. I, I probably would uh, say that she's a little more optimistic than I am as far as um, how GO bonds go, because um, I would, you know, I, I would repeat uh, Councillor Sharmer's comments. You know, the, the uh, public safety buildings, uh, police, fire, rescue, those things. Um, there's a lot of support for those in the community. Um, City halls, uh, community facilities, well, city halls, you know, yeah. are just a little bit tougher. Um, but that being said, and I don't have a good sense of what the community will support since I'm, you know, I'm an interim, um, you know, the, it could be that a, a two to three million dollar um, type of bond would, uh, you know, people would look at that and recognize that the city did its due diligence, has really come to, they put skin in the game, they've really come to the table ready to play um, by buying off a big chunk of that. Um, and, you know, that you're not going to the voters for, you know, the, the whole project, for example. A lot of it is in the messaging and two to $3 million over 20 years at today's interest rates because of the pandemic. I mean, it's hard to beat. I mean, it really is an opportune time uh, if the messaging is is appropriate. Yeah, and and looking at the trade-offs, and that's what we always have to think of because right. doing it all internally means making choices. Right. And as we are talking about having other difficult conversations about rate increases, um, using our internal transfers our internal reserves, building up the money ourselves by foregoing other projects means everybody pays, um, every, everybody will suffer from those rate increases. And we know the future cost of those only goes up, up and up, at least getting the city hall built in a you know one year time frame. the costs are pretty fixed at that point. And then we're just, financing them. So a lot different than looking at kicking other capital projects down the road as those costs increase every time we kick that down the road. So uh, lots of lots of good options. Again, really impressed this year we've made a commitment to put start putting this money aside and I think that's really critical. Um, but I will also, if we go forward with this, in a general obligation bond, remind folks it isn't just a it isn't just an office building, right? It is our public building. It is a building in, into which we invite folks. And I'm sitting in volunteer hall that has been used for numerous public functions, not only public meetings, but you know, also trainings. People rent this room. They've done yoga in it. I mean, there, this this is an active public building in addition to just office space. So um, we we deserve a nice space for that. We can always use better space in this community for those kind of things. So I, I think we we can make a case certainly um, with the kind of care we're taking to move this forward. Uh, Roxanne. Yeah, I, I think kind of um, going off of that idea, I know when we've done um, bonds for chariots, the one that was successful was the one where there was the most input from our board of directors, which would be obviously the, you know, us. Um, and the messaging was, this is for you. You know, and it was just so clear that when the people voted for it, it was like they realized, oh, we're voting for transportation for us. And if I don't use it, I know somebody that does. And so I think so much of the success of this will be based on what the messaging is. And the messaging needs to be that this is Monmouth's, that this is the community. Everybody's asking for it. Here's all the things it does for everybody. And and I, I just think we all absolutely have to be behind whatever whatever that measure is, if we decide we're gonna go for the medium or the small or the large, we all have to be using the same messaging and we're going to have to work. We're gonna to have to do a lot of work and a lot of community engagement. And we're gonna to need to talk to people and make sure they know that this is theirs. It's not for us, this is for Monmouth, so. 
It's my soapbox. Chris Lopez. I, you know, I, uh, I think uh, Councillor Belts really hit it on the head there. Um, we can do a lot of work, but if we don't really get buy-in, and uh, that's through that's through how it's messaged and how uh, you know how we promote it and how we speak about it, um, none of this is going to happen, regardless of which avenue we take. Um, as soon as we go for a go bond, or if we do go for a go bond and it gets voted down. You know, it's it's on people's radar, and uh, if then cost of services goes up, I uh, you know I I think that's uh, that that's even worse than just cost of services going up to begin with and not going for a go bond. Um, it's almost uh, a referendum as it was. Um, are there any outlets to um, to to look to for uh, you know whether it's the um, whether it's the uh, the um, Cog or some other organization that we can uh, that we can ping for ideas on how to message this proactively and how to do it right. I I think that uh, you know you can talk to other entities that other councils. Uh, League of Oregon Cities actually um, has has really good leadership who have who have done very successful bonds um, on all kinds of fronts, including city halls. <laughs> and uh, so you know uh, that network is a wonderful way to to try. Um, certainly, you can look on uh, Oregon ballots on the, on the state website and see which ballot, which ballot measures passed and talk to those entities. Um, that's, that's what my inclination would be. Yeah. Yeah. So in the past, when I worked on projects that required something like this, um, we would reach out to our, um, various, uh, peers and solicit input as to strategies that they use to engage the community uh, for this. The only uh, comment that I would have about that is, uh, I always considered it pretty important to be a homegrown, you know, grassroots effort. We do it. We don't hire the slick person to come in and develop, you know, the bright shiny stuff. We get out there and we do it. Um, and when in, in Carleton, when we were looking at the city hall project, using FFA, and it was we didn't go for a city hall geo bond per se we were going to use a combined you know like you try to do we were going to use the geo bond for the public safety facility and we were going to use um, the other uh, resources that we could for the city hall piece and we st i must have had um, 15 at least 15 small group um, presentations with 15 people and we, we went out and we did a lot of engagement to the community now it's it still failed, 60-40, um, which was my joke at the beginning, because that's what Salem's um, <laughs> bond had gone down, 60-40. And I remember telling the chief at the time, I said, okay, we're at 60-40 before we start, so we got to swing 11%, and we finished at 60-40. Um, but I really like the uh, uh, grassroots, homegrown, you know, engagement where we're out, um, kind of working because it's it's our project it's while we could use advice i think it's better to go out and solicit i uh, talk to others where it worked and i'll and i'll tell you chris um our last successful bond as a city was the police station uh purchase and refurbishment and we did do some polling on that we did have some professional polling to sort of determine uh, the community appetite for the costs on that and those kinds of things are pretty common um, yeah. in in any kind of effort where you do some sort of checking with the community before you go so you know what the what the pinch points are what the sensitive points are um, but other than that we as a community have been pretty successful again our Fire department um, has an operating levy. Our county has an operating levy. We did our library. We did our police station. So I, I think doing those internally is uh, pretty common for us in this community. And, and I wasn't here, but I understand from my colleagues that the last time that we put the city hall on the ballot, 
um, it was actually extremely close and that part of the challenge was the mixed messaging that occurred from leadership. And so again, you know, being all on the same page, provided you are all on the same page, obviously, um, that's that seems to be very critical to it. And I think this community has said again and again that they are interested in having a safe and functional and beautiful building on Main Street. And that, that's why it's part of the urban renewal uh, project um, list as well, and has been a city council goal for a long time. <laughs> well, and I think we have private developers investing in our downtown. Um, they've been doing it for a long time. We've got a lot of new activity here. It it sure seems like we need to step up and do our part to take <laughs> take <clears throat> improve their view um, as they are improving our view. So uh, more conversation to come. But any last questions, Darren? Yeah, I would like to see us, I guess, kind of get our logic down and arguments for the urban renewal uh, portion. And, you know, we've got an opportunity there if, if whatever we can rationalize, that could really leverage pretty well against the project. I mean, I'm seeing, you know, 2 million versus 4 million roughly there. Uh, so I think that's one we need to nail down early if that's what we're one, a piece of what we're going to use. I think that the messaging then is really, really important. I thought we did a pretty good job with the police station and the property and all that. And really the council was behind that. And, you know, so once we get that messaging figured out, we all gotta help go out and sell it. You know, we got lots of signatures. We did all kinds of stuff to, to make that work. Um, so, you know, again, I think we just gotta keep moving forward now that we have a, well, to me, it looks like a very nice plan for the facility. Uh, you know, if we can get the financing kind of nailed down and and all get of one mind for the most part, then we're at 80% there in my mind. Some guidance or direction for staff about how, when you want to move this along, John? Uh, a, a couple things, and, I'll, and, and without being redundant or too much so, <clears throat> I think everybody's talking about messaging. I think that's important, and I like the fact that we would be able to um, show the city's contribution, that the city is, co uh, is contributing to this, that we just don't simply have our hand out uh, to the voters. Um, I think it's important, and a little bit to Darren's point, um, we need to make certain that we're able to identify the urban renewal contribution um, as it relates to urban redevelopment downtown, economic impact of that. Uh, a lot of the things we want to do with that, with that uh, urban renewal fund is, is to uh, stimulate the economy um, and build a, a basis for future expansion. And so we need to be able to tie that in there to the degree that we can. And then I think it's important to be upfront with the voters. Um, I wouldn't be a, opposed to some of the other sort of things, but the reality is if we keep building a, a budget here, that the, you know, the reality is, is that we're gonna be cutting services, or well, we're gonna be limited in services, and we're gonna be likely increasing rates. Um, that, that, that my tummy doesn't feel good about that. I, you know, I, I mean, I think there's a little of that, that, but not a whole bunch of it. So I think we're up front with it. And if it goes down, it goes down. Um, now, we'll need to decide how, how big we want to go. That, that's part of it. But my bigger question is when? If we're going to do this GO bond at, at any level, when are we going to do it? November is like tomorrow. And November is the best time um, because there's going to be a lot of people voting. And in the city of Monmouth, you know, there'll be an active, uh, <clears throat> you know, depending on whether the students here or not, there'll be an active um, group that is likely to be uh, favorable towards this sort of a, of a project. Um, you know, I think we need some direction. I remember a little differently than 
you know, I, I think our role in the police deal was informational. I think, and if we didn't, we should have had a political action group that can go out and be persuasive. And whether that's the mom of business people or, or, or who, I don't know, but we need to, we can, we can, and Lane will correct me here um, if I'm wrong, but I think that we're able to provide information. Remember, we, we were, I wouldn't say shackled, but we were uh, advised to be very careful about that. If we were to go to May um, or some other special, we've got to think about the double majority, I think, don't we? Uh, that needs to be part of, of the consideration. And then finally, um, or do we have any um, any bonds that are expiring in the in the sort of medium term? I know none in the near, but maybe in the medium. That's, and that's that's all. If I can weigh in just on that for just a second, I will say you can you could write off this November. I was going. I was looking up the election calendar as you were speaking, John. But um, we're coming very close. Um, uh, before we can get a measure turned into the um, uh, county clerk, we have to have the, the council has to adopt a uh, ballot title resolution that has to be published in the itemizer period of time for challenges to be filed to the um, uh, to the ballot title. And I just uh, running those numbers, looking at the calendar, uh, I, I think you couldn't make the deadline to get the ballot measure to the clerk in time for the November election. My recollection is that May is not a double majority election anymore. Um, I think it is not. Uh, so I don't think you'd be looking at a double majority then. Uh, what else, there was one other thing I was gonna say about that. But uh, yeah, um, so yeah, I think November is, is out of the question. Uh, May is feasible and, I, and I, I do not believe that's a double majority election. So uh, Roxanne lost connection, and I think Laurel might have as well. So kind of want to take some last comments and wrap up if we can't get them back. Darren? I was going to say, we did have a pact for the police station. And again, that's where it allows us as council members to really be active and stuff. And so I would think that would make sense again if we're going to go back out. And we need to do that well in front of of our process so you know we got plenty of time like you said no way this november but you know we could be starting first of the year basically for next november uh, a year from now per se yeah and just that, that's the other thing i was going to just see so have this in mind council members can advocate for a ballot measure all the way up to election day the limitation is on the ability to use city staff city resources uh, uh to advocate and, and that uh, the cutoff date for that is the filing of the measure with the county clerk. So if you again, if you could do November, you'd essentially be cutting that that opportunity off uh, from the get go uh, to be able to use city staff uh, or resources for any kind of anything more than just basic information. Uh, so that is that is the election limitation that you have. Um, once the measure measure is filed with the county, uh, city resources can't be used. City employees can't be um, uh, out advocating for it um, uh, on, on city time. Uh, council members, though, you are you can advocate uh, right up to right up to election day. Uh, question uh, about we, the bond or not? <laughs> me, given, uh, given the fact that November's off the table. Um, and we may be looking at May, we probably ought to, you know, let the cost estimators know that the June of 21 start date is probably going to be off the table as well, wouldn't you think? No, I, I, I don't think I can say that for sure. Oh. Yeah. Did you, you once you get it approved, you can get to market pretty quickly. Yeah, once you once it gets approved, you you can move pretty quick on that. And again, we'll have uh, sufficient resources. We'll have some resources in hand um, at that point. And the agency, again, we're asking for 
the uh, Urban Renewal Agency to have a meeting um, this month so that we can have some discussion about this because um, this is a big piece of the agency's funding uh, and projects. So just like what uh, Darren said earlier, we do need, uh, the agency needs clarity as to, you know, is this gonna be your one of your signature projects, um, you know, that the agency is gonna do. So, but I think if the, if you go to the May election, I, my experience has been, you can move pretty quick. Yeah. And, and I would say as well, if it's tax exempt debt, <laughs> which I've been harping on a lot lately to Chad, Chad's chagrin, yeah. <laughs> um, spending it down quickly um, for arbitrage concerns, even though our interest rates are super low and we probably wouldn't be subject to arbitrage, but um, would be the pref the preferred approach. And so, um, yes, we can turn around quite quickly. And to your point also, uh, Councillor Kerry, about the... Um, the timing of bonds coming off. Our earliest full faith and credit bonds that are coming off are in 2026, the sewer bonds. And so they're sewer bonds and we're actually paying for them with sewer monies, but they are full faith and credit. And then 2028 is the next one with our pension obligations. So it's not not near term. And I don't know if you consider that medium term. <laughs> this, I consider that short term. That's pretty short term. Okay. We don't have a lot hanging there. No, yeah. but just as far as if you're trying to, you know, yes, you can talk about 2026 and 2028, our debt load coming down um, as a, as a, as a finer point. Yeah. You know, if, if, if you know, I, I, I do think we'd want to have a conversation with, with our people, uh, you know, about that scenario, because um, if you've got a, a, a May election and you've got bids and you've got, you know, there's a lot of, ordering and there's a, there's a lot of you know preparation work that needs to be done on the part of the contractors um you know are they gonna i, I just don't i simply don't know what, whether they would be i mean what their interest levels would be um you know obviously they would do it on a you know pending approval by the voters but um i you know i, I just don't know i mean i think I mean, if everybody's comfortable with that, then, I, then so am I. But I, I, I just don't know whether we could turn it in June, maybe in September. Uh, I don't know. In, yeah, the sub, let, look, maybe we can talk. Let's talk as an urban renewal agency, because yeah. I think that is something. I am also interested in our economic development ad hoc advisory committee sort of giving some feedback about this because again it's a major impact on downtown so i think we can gather a little bit more information before we go down that road for example september is a special election which we would have to pay for and double majority and all that so you know we we don't need to get into those weeds right now right. i think the urban renewal will be our next step yeah yeah so i think the decision by the agency will kind of uh, dictate which option you look at how much money your the agency is willing to contribute to the project to, to some extent is going to answer some of these other questions and i think just a uh, councillor Kerry's comment um, if you have a may 21 election the financing piece is not, I mean, you're just, it's a discussion about readiness to proceed. And is right. it a June 1st versus September 15th um, discussion? Is it all of the 285, 285,000 that FFA identified um, if there's, if it goes out to like June 22? Th those questions will just be answered over, over time. And, but I don't think the magnitude on this schedule is I think you're just you're in a wheelhouse that you shouldn't be too worried about escalation, which is really goes to the heart of your comment. Cease. No, cease. Yes. Can I just? Yes. Uh, I want. To, I have a chance to bring up the election calendar while we've been talking, and so uh, you you could shoehorn this into November, but I'm going to urge you not to. Um, September. Oh, I'm sorry. August 14 is the last day to publish a ballot title which for us means August 12th, because that's Wednesday, which is next Wednesday, which means you would have to have the ballot title drafted and you would have to meet and approve it by noon this Friday. Um, and I'm gonna suggest that there's probably not enough time to 
put all the ducks in line to make that work. Even though technically the calendar would accommodate it, uh, I, I'm going to say I don't think you're there yet to get a ballot title done in three days' time. Elaine, it's, it sounds like this is a, are you daring us? Or is <laughs> is no, that a no, challenge? But, but, but I, 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 I'm concerned that somebody might go home and check the calendar tonight on the Secretary of State's website and say, well, Shetterly said it was too late. It's not too late. Um, so I'm letting <laughs> you know it's not too late, but I think it's too late. Yeah, I know. I'm just teasing. All right, uh, both Roxanne and Laurel lost connection. Roxanne's back on the phone. Um, I did promise council that we could take just a brief moment of council comments because we didn't have that on the agenda earlier. So if you have a few thoughts you wanna share, uh, please take a moment, be brief, and we can do that now. Anybody? <clears throat> Can you hear me? Yes, Roxanne. I just wanted to thank Power and Light and Chuck's team for coming out to Edwards Edition after our construction crew messed up our power. And from the time our power went out to the time it was back on was less than 60 minutes today. It was so impressive. And I called them and told them thank you. So good job. Thanks. They do good work. They do good work. They do damn fine work. It helps that, you know, they were across the field from <laughs> from where the construction accident happened and the tractor cut through the line. But yeah. Any other comments? Chris? You know, at the risk of sounding like a broken record, I will uh, I will encourage everyone to be safe, wear masks, follow government orders. Pay attention to, to to what the governor is saying and um, uh, do what you can to save yourselves and your neighbors and loved ones. Thanks. Um, and I'll just make a, a brief uh, just just to let everyone know um, we we did have a large crowd here this evening. I think you can see them on the computer that we had set outside. Um, we had also here in the room, and I'm, I, you couldn't see that because we don't have our streaming camera, but we did have uh, nine people who were here and indicated they were supporting Bodhi's comments. So I did let his comments go on a little longer simply because he had other folks who were interested or indicated they were here to support him. And I, I let those comments go on. Um, and I know we don't respond to those, and I will be getting uh, the full text of uh, what Bodhi spoke about, and I will try to respond some of that, I think, on behalf of myself personally, but also on behalf of council, that there are clearly some misconceptions going on. Um, we, have, we have actually not talked at all about defunding police and that hasn't really been asked of us. So um, somehow I think conversations going on outside our community are really starting to seep in. Um, I'm gonna speak for myself only personally, but I, I think I know all of you well enough to say that, that none of us has um, is interested in implementing of any form of government other than the one in, that we have, uh, which honors our constitution, honors the laws, of our country, and um, I know that was again a, a reaction and a comment. Maybe, maybe these people feel because of what's going on outside of Monmouth, but I know that doesn't relate to Monmouth or to any of us. And I, I want a chance to thoughtfully uh, respond to some of that. Meet with Bodie myself. Um, have him take that back to the group that. Our interest in looking at issues of justice and equality and um, economic opportunity are, are born of our desire to make this a better community to live for all and certainly don't want that to be seen as divisive. Um, we've had some extremely thoughtful comments and presentations from folks and I, I do know Bodhi well and his was heartfelt as well. Um, and there will be opportunities through our roundtable discussions to, to bring folks together and, and to have 
more of those kind of honest conversations where people are not making assumptions and not ascribing um, beliefs, I think, that are unfair because they are not born of any action we're taking here or um, that we have been asked to do. So that's my comment about that. Um, we 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 are listening to everyone have a con everyone gets a say and we will be able to respond in another time just couldn't do that this evening so uh, madam mayor i i would just like yes, to John. say uh, from my perspective and i think probably others i think you did a masterful job of handling the in-room crowd uh today it was a wise move to allow the the uh expansion of time uh, because it was coherent all the way from the beginning to the end. And, uh, and with others in the room, uh, it saved us all some time. So uh, your, your uh, diplomacy was recognized and appreciated. Thank you. All right. No other comments. Um, I will then uh, entertain a motion for adjournment. Chad, you don't get to move that. Darren. <laughs> okay, I had a community announcement quick though. Can I do that still? Oh, quick. Thank quick. you, yes. Okay, community so the next three Tuesdays, we still have food boxes coming. St. Patrick's Church, and the timing is always interesting. So look at it at the St. Patrick's Church Facebook page, but it's been around 200 boxes each of the of the past Tuesdays. Great help to the community, I believe, and it's going to happen at least the last one that right now scheduled is uh, Tuesday, August 25th. So every Tuesday morning, sometime between 9:45 and 12:45, I would expect it to happen. And then I'll, I yes, thank you. recommend adjournment. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Well, <laughs> thank you, Roxanne, for adding in, and we are adjourned. Thank you. Thursday, 5.30. Thursday at 5.30. Don't forget. Thanks.